5.30 a.m. Tuesday. John H. Patterson had not slept well, and this was most unusual for him, since even the most pressing of matters rarely interfered with his sleep. He used no alarm clock, yet always awoke at 5.45 a.m. and arrived at his office in the National Cash Register Company at 6.30. Punctuality, he had often said, is a great virtue. On this Tuesday morning, however, he had awakened at 4.40 a.m. and lain in bed a short time listening to the persistent dripping from the eaves during the innumerable times he had, rou had roused during the night. The same sound had always been there. He had known at this final awakening that further sleep would not come, and he arose. Now, after a light breakfast and two cups of coffee, he rang for his car. The great old clock in the hallway of his estate, Far Hills, solemnly bonged the half hour. Fifteen minutes later, he stepped out of the car in front of NCR and told his driver to wait. He went directly to his office, calling Behringer in behind him as he pressed through the outer office. If the secretary was surprised to see the president three quarters of an hour earlier than usual, he did not show it. Behringer stood quietly by, unquestioning, but ready for any instructions that might come. Patterson walked directly to his window and looked out. His eyes widened. The great Miami River looked nearly half again as large as it had the previous afternoon. He next went to the roof and carefully studied not only the river's condition, where it left Dayton just opposite NCR, a half mile to the west, but also where Wolf Creek entered it, near West Third Street, where the Mad River entered from the east and the Stillwater River from the north. All of them, including the Great Miami, entering Dayton from the northeast, were running bank full. Patterson had seen Dayton suffer minor flooding many times over the past three score years, and usually it had been caused by one or two of the rivers overflowing, while the other two or three remained only slightly higher than normal. Once only in 1866, three of the rivers had been at flood stage, but this was the first time all four rivers were full to the point of overflowing as far as the eye could see upstream. Without a word, he turned and re-entered the building, Behringer only slightly behind him. On the way down, he instructed his secretary, call the powerhouse. From now until I cancel it, I want the whistle blown at one minute intervals for 30 seconds. Behringer dipped his head and made the call from his office as Patterson waited. Then they went downstairs together, got into the car and drove along the downtown levees. Twice they passed small squads of National Guardsmen, but though Patterson took note of them, he made no comment, nor did he remark about the abnormal number of police and firemen on the streets. Everywhere they went, there were crowds of people standing on the levees, watching the fascinating spectacle of over 100,000 cubic feet of water passing every second. On the, on the levee along Monument Avenue, there were literally hundreds of people with the most congested area between Main Street and Monument Avenue. Patterson tapped his driver on the shoulder. Stop, he said and added, turning to Barringer. Wait here. He got out and climbed the levee just behind the central fire station. At the top, 15 feet above street level, he was shaken in spite of himself at the sight of the river, running past with an evil swishing less than five inches from the top. Spectators huddling under umbrellas talked and laughed and gazed in wonder at the force of the water. 
but no one seemed particularly concerned. Scattered comments reached Patterson's ears over the whistles and church bells. Just look at her. Ain't that something? By golly, I never seen it this high before. Lowlands will be flooded sure, this keeps up. Suppose it might run over? Hell no. Ain't raining half as hard now as it was an hour ago. Woo-wee! Look at that river. Hey, Maygene, Jerry, y'all come up here and take a look-see. Disgusted, Patterson turned abruptly and half slid back down the slope. His nostrils flared and his brows pinched down in an angry glare. He slammed the door hard. Back to the office, he told the driver, leaning back in the seat. He shook his head. The fools, he said softly, bitterly. The incredible fools. At, at the door to his office, he turned to Barringer. I'm calling a full-scale executive meeting at exactly 645 in the large conference room. I want all of them. No excuses. Berenger glanced at the clock. It was 635.